I'm very grateful uh, and honored to welcome Secretary French to uh, Senate Education to spend some time with us. Uh, before we do introductions, what I've asked Mr. Uh, uh, Secretary French to talk a little bit about today is, is just introducing himself, his agency, uh, and also start by telling us a little bit about what he's seeing on the ground, uh, with the kinds of things that um, you know we might not be seeing, and where his agency might need assistance as we as they continue to grapple with COVID. Um, and uh, why don't I leave it at that? But Mr. Secretary, I'm looking around. Do you know the this incredible group of uh, colleagues of mine? Um, I think I know some more than others. So right. I would why don't we just that. go around and say, uh, uh, if everyone would just sort of say uh, their district, that would be great and start with Senator Hooker. Good afternoon, Secretary French, Cheryl Hooker from Rutland. I know you know Senator Lyons, but go for it. Uh, Jenny Lyons, Chittenden County. Senator Chittenden? Senator Chittenden of Chittenden Senate District. Uh, Senator Terenzini. Secretary French, uh, this is Josh Terenzini from Rutland County. And uh, Senator Perkslick. Hello, oh, Secretary Andy Perkslick, Washington County. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Well, we'll leave it with you. Well, thank you, Senator Campion, um, and good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, what I thought I'd do is, uh, Senator Campion's intro, I'll uh, introduce myself and a brief uh, overview of the work of the agency. Then I just put together quick slides on a COVID response. I thought that was a good way to um, provide an overview, but also stimulate uh, some questions you might have for future testimony that I can follow up on. Um, but what way of introduction, um, I've been secretary since 2018, August 2018. Uh, more or less, um, it's my career as a Vermont educator. I started as a uh, high school history teacher up in Colebrook, New Hampshire, if you're familiar with that neck of the woods, uh, kind of near the Canadian border. Um, did that for five years, crossed over into Vermont. My first job in Vermont, I was principal of the Canaan Schools, which is in the corner of New Hampshire and Quebec and Vermont, where they all come together. Um, and I was seven years a principal of a pre-K through 12 school at the time, had about 300 students. Um, and then became superintendent there for three years. Uh, was the Essex North Supervisory Union, uh, which is Norton, uh, Canaan, Leamington, Bloomfield, Brunswick, and um, most of the unincorporated towns and gores uh, today. Uh, so I was up there about 15 years and then moved to uh, Manchester, Vermont, in southwestern Vermont in 2007, where I became the principal of the Bennington Rutland Supervisory Union. That was my last superintendency, and I did that for nine years. Uh, those towns are um, Sunderland, Manchester, Dorset, Pollitt, Rupert, Mount Tabor, Danby, Londonderry, Landgrove, Weston, Peru, and Winhall. Um, so it's kind of a large uh, multi-district supervisor, you know, as we call it. So I did that for nine years. Um, I, my job after that was at St. Michael's College, uh, where I ran the graduate program, the school leadership program for aspiring principals, um, special ed directors, curriculum directors, and that. It was from that position uh, that I was appointed secretary. I also, at that time I was working at the college, I was also doing a lot of consulting statewide, um, largely around Act 46, uh, but most of my work as a consultant was around operational uh, effectiveness for multi-district supervisory unions. So, um, the agency uh, is about 160 employees. Um, I think the key takeaways to know is that a large part of our work is about administering federal programs and um, of which they run the gamut from special education to uh, feeding kids, uh, child nutrition, um, do some curriculum work. So it, pretty much any aspect of the K-12 operation you could think of the agencies involved in to a certain extent. Uh, we're not really involved in higher education, so that's the distinction I would make, um, and that, that varies around the country. Some uh, agencies are more involved in higher ed than others. Um, we moved to the National Life Building, so we're not far from the State House. Uh, we moved to National Life last year, um, so we weren't long in National Life uh, when the COVID emergency began, but that's, that's our new home, and we'll have to give you a tour at some point. 
So um, you have some of uh, the slides, uh, the PDF document that I think I'd share with you. Ed. I'm just going to jump into that and I'd be happy to take any questions as I go along. Um, but this um, was designed to sort of stimulate some conversation, but also provide a useful uh, tool for me to organize uh, my comments. And Jeannie, um, I'm not sure if I can advance these or not, um, since you're sharing them, I believe, but if you want to go to the next screen. Thanks. So I thought I'd start off by talking about um, what our response has been to COVID. Um, and it's, I, I, these are my terms. They're not ones that we use often, uh, but this is just, you know, when I reflect back on the experience, um, really I, I break it down into phases uh, and we're still kind of in phase three and phase four, but uh, the first phase of this response in education, I call the emergency response. You know, the, there was a state of emergency declared. We literally shut down our school system overnight. Um, and had to figure out how to uh, keep it working uh, in a full remote situation. Um, and that was a, a period where, uh, you know, the governor's executive order um, became sort of our construct for regulating and operating the system. So it was a very frenetic time uh, where we had to figure out how to stand up um, our response to support districts, largely in communications, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but really just figuring out how to keep the lights on, essentially keep feeding kids. If you remember that time, it was a really, um, busy, very crazy time where we, we were literally cranking out new, uh, we call it guidance. Now we take that term for granted, but guidance that basically functions as regulation, uh, under the authority, the emergency order. So it was a very busy time. Uh, we're inventing things as we went along, uh, trying to do the best we can, and I, I say that goes from March to June. Uh, somewhere around June uh, is when we had to start thinking about uh, reopening school in the fall. Um, we had under the original uh, executive order, the gutter, governor had asked me to um, produce some guidance relative to the high school graduation. I don't know if you remember that experience. So we had around May 8th, I was asked to produce guidance pertaining to graduation. It's right around that time point that conditions started to improve uh, literally on a weekly basis, we saw the viral conditions improving. Um, and it's around that point where we were like starting to come to the conclusion, I say we nationally as well, that this emergency was not going to be over at the end of the school year. Uh, I think for those of us that work in education, we always think, you know, the end of the school year brings the closure and then we have the summer and then the fall we start anew. Um, it started to really sink into everyone that the emergency was not going to be over with the school year. And therefore, the summer was not going to be about remediating all the, the negative impact of the emergency that we really, we had a bit of breathing space, but really the summer was about planning for the fall in the next phase of the emergency. So it's right around that point around June, where we really started to engage um, with the planning of reopening schools uh, in the fall. And that became the, the big, uh, big scope of the work, um, which is where we, uh, you know, working closely with the Department of Health has just been wonderful in a leadership role in so many different aspects of our response. But particularly on reopening, um, we've produced a very large sort of comprehensive reopening document uh, that's very prescriptive in some ways about um, the mitigation uh, processes schools must, must, must use to operate um, safely. And I can get more into all of that. That's when the coronavirus relief fund was coming out and so forth. But all, you know, all of that was really focused on logistics. It wasn't so much focused on education. It was really about how do we, how do we operate schools safely? And it was around the end of September when we were starting to congratulate ourselves, like mission accomplished. That went really well. Um, now we can start thinking about recovery, the emergencies over. And somewhere around Halloween, uh, the conditions started to deteriorate pretty rapidly again. And we knew um, <clears throat> through this holiday period that we're in now, that's why I, I sort of draw the demarcation around phase three, around the end of September. You know, we, we sort of had completed the reopening of schools, uh, but now we're sort of in this continuous operation mode until we can shift into recovery. And that's kind of where we are right now. We're, we're kind of getting ready to pivot, I think, towards recovery. But this continuous operations has been 
about um, just getting more comfortable uh, with daily case counts in schools. You know, we still knock on wood, don't see um, a lot of transmission of the virus in schools. But if you, I don't know if you remember back in the spring, a single case uh, of the virus sent shivers to the whole system. And now we just sort of, we've become more accepting and uh, learned to live with the virus to a certain extent. Um, but we also do the hard work of all our school employees. Uh, we're able to sort of maintain fairly safe operations in spite of the conditions. And um, we've been fortunate as Dr. Fauci, when we had him in Vermont, uh, observed, um, if you can maintain the good conditions in your broader society, you can do other things like operate schools. So um, Vermont's, um, Vermont's been fortunate through the hard work and, you know, Vermonters really accepting the fact that they all have got to work together to allow that to happen. So what we're about to do now is pivot towards what we're calling the recovery phase uh, in anticipation of warmer weather, in anticipation of uh, the vaccines uh, that will be emerging. And, and basically all that boils down to conditions improving uh, as compared to where they are right now. So we're starting to do that work uh, to do the planning, which I can talk about more. And that's really, I think, uh, will be a big part of our conversation with you this spring um, is how to, how to really bring our resources to bear uh, to mitigate or address the impact of this emergency on kids. Um, and that's, that's really the central premise of recovery work for in education relative to the COVID emergency. So why don't we uh, go to the next slide? So um, just sort of an overview of what, you know, the sort of the folks think about the reopening guidance uh, as the centerpiece of what we've done. And I, I would agree it's, it's sort of a precondition of everything else we want to do. We have to, on a daily basis, uh, stay focused on safety. Um, so we can talk about things like remote learning and so forth, but it's really a lot of it's predicated on sort of the daily attention to detail that allows our schools uh, to operate safely. So just to distill down what now is close to 40 pages worth of prescriptive guidance, um, this is it in a nutshell. Basically, um, firstly, we try to um, prevent uh, COVID from entering the operational environment of a school. And we do that through a daily health check screening that all school staff and all students are required to complete. Um, and I will say, None of these are designed to be perfect. It's, it's really a layered response when taken together, uh, they, they reduce the risk. So on a daily basis, all students and staff are required to uh, answer those questions. Do you have symptoms? Have you, have you been associated with someone who's COVID positive? Have you traveled out of state? Uh, certainly the distancing inside of schools, which has had an impact on you know, what classrooms look like today, uh, wearing masks, um, and disinfection. And we take some of these things for granted. Um, you know, we, we open schools with the requirement that everyone had to wear a mask. Um, that's not the case in every state in the country. You know, so we've arguably our guidance is not only very prescriptive, prescriptive, but also um, pretty significant in terms of its requirements. And uh, that's reflected in our, our sort of positive outcomes, if you will, from an operational standpoint. We still have relatively low case counts inside our schools. Um, so we, on the one hand, we're very prescriptive in terms of the uh, health requirements. On the other hand, uh, we let left it to districts to sort of to decide the instructional mode. And this is where we get into the issue of in-person, remote, or some mixture of the two in the form of hybrid. And this, uh, this, this, this approach of sort of balancing the two on the one hand, requiring very prescriptive health requirements, on the other hand, uh, providing the flexibility wasn't wasn't like a political decision. It was based on just, um, as you heard my background, um, a real uh, practical understanding of the diversity of our education system. And that's that's a theme you'll hear from a lot of my testimony is that there's significant variation across the state, even among school districts, on uh, the conditions in which their schools operate. So not all schools operate in the same manner or have the capacity to operate in the same manner. So we had to uh, allow districts basically to adjust their operations based on the, the complex logistics that are involved in holding school every day. And a significant logistical consideration here is the availability of staff. So um, in any given day, you know, we, we had a shortage of substitute teachers before the COVID emergency began. Certainly COVID has exacerbated those concerns. Um, but we have, we have staff availability issues, we have transportation issues, um, you name it. 
Um, so schools, schools are juggling all those things on a daily basis, let alone when they get a call from the health department saying you have a positive case and then they have to move into a mode to assist the health department in contact tracing. So needless to say, uh, this slide um, not only represents 40 pages of prescriptive guidance, um, it also uh, represents the hard work that everyone's been doing just to keep the lights on, so to speak, in the system. And this, um, this work has created a significant amount of fatigue in the school systems right now, um, let alone you know, the juggling between remote, in-person, and so forth but just all the work that goes into maintaining a safe and learning environment. It's been a significant, very significant undertaking on the part of our school system. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, from the agency standpoint, a big part of our response to the agency, I would qualify as being communication support. Um, you know, we, um, we were not organized obviously to deal, you know, with the logistics behind uh, supporting our districts in a pandemic or providing leadership during a pandemic. Um, Pre-COVID, you know, as I sort of gave a quick overview of the agency's operations, the better part of what we do is administer federal programs. We had very little involvement in sort of the operational aspects of school districts. Um, so we had to learn, you know, stand up new groups and activities to do that. So we have a, a COVID uh, response team that meets twice every day in the morning, once in the morning and once in the afternoon. And they also interface with the State Emergency Operations Center. Uh, so there's a direct connection between um, our operational uh, deliberations and uh, the broader state response. Uh, we also had to figure out how to deal, you know, with the, all the communications coming in and coming out. So we had to stand up a help desk. So all these sort of these communication structures are really critical. Um, somewhere in the summer, uh, I was dealing, you know, through that sort of emergency phase, dealing directly as a member of the governor's cabinet and sort of that reactionary sort of mode of the planning as we started to turn the corner into uh, reopening schools and the, the prioritization of uh, school uh, in-person instruction. Um, I, I've been plugged more directly into that, so I meet, um, three times a week, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, is part of a core team that looks at the health data with Dr. Levine and so forth. Um, we provide regular COVID updates, so we took all this communication down, and um, at one point it was a daily communication to superintendents. We've since weaned that down to more a couple times a week, um, but to give them sort of a summary um, of what's going on, and, and particularly as we were producing a lot of guidance uh, documents uh, in the beginning, um, and then we started to get in the habit of doing uh, weekly calls uh, with the superintendents. So I do a statewide video call. Uh, the superintendents are more, they're the CEOs of their school districts. So they're in more aligned from an operational standpoint with my authority. So it's important that we retain very close communications more so than some of the other uh, entities. Um, we started just out of necessity doing a weekly call. Uh, we talked a couple times on and off. I can look it back at my calendar and say, let's, maybe we can stop doing this in May, you know, and uh, we've continued to find it very useful uh, process. Um, and then similarly, uh, I was uh, contacted by uh, the various uh, advocacy, I'll say advocacy groups, the various professional associations in education, including Vermont NEA, the principals, the superintendents, the school boards, if they could meet with me more regularly. And that's uh, sort of settled off into what we call the advisory group. And that group meets uh, every Friday. And uh, that includes representatives from the Department of Health, school nurses, school business officials. Uh, we've got some teachers on there. Um, so it's, it's a, a group um, that I think has been really, really useful in helping us stay connected. Because it's in many times during the emergency, it's been a very fluid situation, very dynamic situation. So um, the better part of what we've tried to do, both through uh, the superintendents and the advisory group, is to sort of just convey to folks what the sense of dynamism is. You know, it's like, I'm, today I'm sharing with you what I know, tomorrow we might have something new to digest, and just to help prepare the system for the rapid changes that occurred at some points. Um, and, and, and fortunately now, as we were after school open, we also have a little more breathing room now, so we can also do some more longer term planning. So you want to go to Gary the front, I just want to yeah. give you a, about a 10 minute warning. Uh, we have uh, also have Dr. Levine on kind of a tight schedule starting at about 2.30. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, 
in the financial support, this will be a big area where we'll, we'll be interested in engaging with you on, um, you know, all this work has required significant financial uh, support. So we, uh, you're familiar with the CARES Act. I just point out, we have a couple terms in there and, you know, in education, we do use a lot of acronyms, but uh, ESSER and GEAR. Uh, so you're, I think you're more all familiar with the CARES Act or what we call the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Um, education has its own discrete funding in addition to that. So we have ESSER, which is the Elementary Secondary Education Relief Fund, and GEAR is the Governor's Education Emergency Relief Fund. Um, those were set up under the CARES Act recently, and the, the new package of relief, um, Congress has decided to put more money into those existing programs. So we call them ESSER 2, GEAR 2, and then this thing called EANS, which I haven't come up with a clever way to pronounce yet, but it's um, it's a separate uh, dedicated source of funding for non-public schools. The N, N in there stands for non-public schools. So um, there's independent school funding basically uh, being secured separately from how it was done previously. Um, next slide. And so I'll just end on where we're really pushing now is to start thinking about recovery. Um, not many states in the country are ready to turn towards this work. I think we are probably uniquely uh, positioned to do that, but it's all predicated uh, on conditions improving. Uh, so we've sort of come up with a, a conceptualization of where we think uh, that work should be grounded, and it's in these sort of three domains, the mental health, well-being, re-engagement, and truancy, and academic success. Uh, we're now going through a process with working uh, in the month of January with our stakeholder groups to sort of refine uh, what we think the conceptualization should be for recovery to point the school system to engage in that work. Um, and then uh, we're at the agency and I'm thinking we're going to be requiring school districts to submit a plan, basically a recovery plan as a way to uh, point the systems uh, towards that work for a number of reasons, one of which is to make sure that we're uh, making maximum use of our funding in that regard but also we expect that there's going to be an increased need to uh, coordinate other resources from uh, other aspects of state government, such as mental health and youth services and so forth. So it's gonna be useful to uh, create a structure to begin uh, to really um, assess what the impact of the emergency has been on kids and then to organize our support systems. So I, I think I'll end there. Um, we've got a few minutes left to be happy. You know, this is a real sort of general conversation. Be happy to answer any questions uh, from an introductory standpoint or on COVID specifically. Um, but I look forward to working with you this session. We have a lot of a lot of work to do together. So uh, questions, if you don't mind, I'm just going to kick it off, and then if anyone has one, please just uh, indicate. Um, so. How will you, when will you determine how you'll assess, um, you know, prior to your coming on, we talked about there are going to be some students out there that during this time, it was, it was okay, you know, it, it was okay. Families were able to bring different people in, uh, at, you know, tutors, um, a family, a parent may have been home, things might have worked out in some regards, but in others, it was students may really be behind. How, when will that, what would that assessment look like? How do you plan to do it? And when would we, when might you come to us and say, hey, this is where things, this is a picture of, of where things are at? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, we're just so you're aware, it's probably the one number one or number two hot button issue for the new secretary of education to figure out to what extent we'll be offering the required national assessments. In Vermont's case, that's the SBAC, yeah. uh, the Smarter Balance Assessment. So we have to uh, answer this from a national perspective. Uh, we don't necessarily have the flexibility not to give those tests, but this issue of assessment or I'll call sort of more broadly a triage Mm -hmm. uh, we have to begin to sort of do some measurement, um, and this will be one of the questions we engage uh, with districts uh, with. Um, I'm, not, I'm not confident that the large summary assessments are going to provide uh, enough useful information quick enough for us. So we're going to have to figure that out, but I think it is, you know, in spite of the complexity of that question, I think the simple answer for now is that um, this is one of the reasons why we have to put a priority on in-person instruction. So to even do the assessment requires in-person contact with students. So um, we're, we're just gonna, we're for now, push the system towards more in-person instruction if conditions allow it. 
and knowing that the system itself has built-in sort of assessment capacity. And we've got some ideas on how to get that information together at the state level, but that will be one of the big questions we try to answer as part of the recovery planning conversation. Thank you. Questions? Comments? Uh, yes, Senator Hooker. Thank you, thank you, Senator. Uh, Secretary French, I'm curious to know how you handled like the um, staffing situation when you know there's a dearth of subs, as you said, and not to mention that we don't have a, a full complement, I don't believe, of teaching staff. I mean, we could certainly use more. So how did you handle it during the pandemic so far? And um, what are your plans to improve the situation? Yeah, it's a really challenging piece. It's one of the um, one of the variables that really the, made us decide to to introduce that sort of flexibility at the local level, uh, because we knew uh, staff availability uh, wasn't going to be there to let's say require in person. Uh, so, firstly, one of the strategies is to give districts the flexibility to move between in person, remote, and hybrid, because that allows the broadest use of staff. Meaning, there are some staff who are available to teach remotely who might not be available to teach in person. So that was the first thing. Um, a second pattern is we've been very um, flexible on the, the granting of waivers, uh, particularly for school board members. Um, so uh, we've had a large number of school board members volunteer or step forward to be subs. Typically they're not allowed to be regular employees of school districts. So we've really gone out of our way to support them uh, to do that. Uh, we did convene a task force uh, fairly recently to, across state government, including Department of Labor, uh, Department of Public Service, which is involved in the fingerprinting for employees, uh, to sort of do some brainstorming inside of state government to see what more we could do. Um, there's, there's no simple answers to this. We have uh, expedited the finger, fingerprinting, the background check process, I think, as best we can. So if there is a school employee that comes forward for that record check process, they're more or less given uh, the front of the line in, in terms of that processing. Uh, but we don't have any simple answers. Uh, once again, it's, it's part of a demographic challenge that existed prior to the emergency, and it's one that's gonna be with us after the emergency. So I think it's uh, just in terms of um, stimulating conversation for future policy, I think this issue of pipeline and teacher development will, will remain a concern uh, going forward. Uh, as I was traveling around with Act 46 in particular, I often observed in districts that um, we'll probably see schools closing, not because of as much as students declining, but due to availability of staff. We, we have, we're gonna have real staffing shortages in the near future. So and anyway, no I, simple answer, but. If I can follow up on that, I mean, we're, we're thinking in terms of mental health for kids who have been affected by COVID. Um, what is the department, what does the department have in place for staff, for teachers? We don't currently have any staff directly related to mental health uh, services. So that's been more or less a partnership with the mental health department in that regard. Um, so once again, our agency was not really configured for direct service support. Um, we've been meeting regularly with the Department of Health uh, and the Department of Mental Health in particular uh, on these issues. We have uh, sort of a regionalization of these services out in the landscape. We have what are called designated service agencies. Uh, we, we think they're going to um, provide an important role in the recovery phase. So that's one of the reasons we want to get everyone organized um, so we can start really allocating those resources based on need. Does anybody have a final question before we uh, move to Dr. Levine? Secretary French, thanks for all that you're doing. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Uh, we'll have you back, certainly. But Senator Lyons. Uh, I, I used my screen hand, so... You, oh, I apologize. You, you, you I, I, didn't yeah. see it. That's okay. Listen, I, I think um, Senator Hooker actually uh, sent the question in, in the direction of mental health, and it would be good to hear uh, some updates on how that's going, and we'll also hear about it in our committee. Um, I, I do have a question. I'll leave the capital question aside for now in terms of improvements to some of our schools that really need it. Um, but of course, uh, physical education and uh, exercise and participation is so important to brain health. And um, I'm just wondering how you are planning for the future to ensure that kids get that um, 
that outside or inside exercise experience that helps them develop intellectually and emotionally. Yeah, I think you see that emerge in our preliminary planning on the topic of engagement. Um, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about truancy. Um, I think, you know, truancy is more or less just sort of the tip of an iceberg of a broader issues of engagement, including social engagement of all the activities you named, uh, athletics, music, um, just the daily, uh, you know, interaction with uh, teachers and their and fellow students, all those things are just, you know, foundational to us being able to move into recovery. So we put them into the broader heading of uh, engagement or re-engagement, um, and that's going to be an important uh, focus or conceptualization of our recovery work, um, no doubt. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary French. And uh, we look forward to having you back uh, in committee probably sooner rather than later. Thank you. I look forward to working with you. Take care. Thank you. I feel now that we have uh, a, probably, I think some would refer to him as a statewide celebrity these days, uh, Dr. Mark Levine, who has done, uh, I think we'd all agree, just incredible work. Uh, so grateful for him being in the position that he's in. And Dr. Levine, I believe David Englander is also in the waiting room uh, and he will be joining us. If Jeannie would let him in, I suspect you invited him to join you. Uh, so uh, what we thought we might do, Dr. Levine, uh, and you probably know that you're muted, um, it, before uh, we kick it off, we thought we might just introduce ourselves, but the, the overarching themes, if you will, perhaps give us an update on what you're seeing right now statewide. I think, you know, we all, uh, many of us have followed your work closely in your weekly addresses, um, which have been incredibly helpful. And then uh, benchmarks, things that you'll be looking for going forward with regard to what are the kinds of things that you'll want to have in place or that you'll be seeing that you'll say to the governor and to others, okay, Let's, let's move forward with schools reopening statewide. Uh, and then I know it's, it's, it's on people's minds. It was in the Bennington banner, you know, different people are asking it. And I know Senator Lyons also will be looking at this is, and I think we'll just like an update on uh, vaccinations of teachers, school employees, children, um, that kind of thing. But before we get to all of those, I just thought we'd just go around and introduce ourselves you and I have met a little bit. Uh, I'm Brian Campion, State Senator from Bennington County in Wilmington. To my left is Senator Lyons. Uh, good afternoon, it's good to see you, Jitty Lyons, Chittenden uh, County. To my right is uh, the good Senator from Rutland, Senator Terenzini. Hello, Dr. Levine, Josh Terenzini from Rutland County. His counterpart, Senator Hooker. Cheryl Hooker from Rutland County. It's nice to see you. Uh, and then we have Senator Chittenden. Dr. Levine, I'm Thomas Chittenden. I've heard you speak at the South Burlington Rotary. Thank you for everything you've been doing for the state of Vermont. And Senator Perchlick. Hi, Andy Perchlick, representing the 18 towns and two cities of Washington County. Impressive, so great. So thank you, Dr. Levine, for being with us and uh, looking forward to hearing from you and uh, taking some questions. Sure. I'll, I'll try not to, I'll keep my comments on the briefer side so that you can have plenty of question time. How much time are we spending together? Uh, well, we have until three, I mean, we can go as long as we, we have to stop. I think we have somebody coming in at 3.15. We were thinking about a little break in between there, um, yeah. but three o'clock would be nice, 25 minutes. Good. Thank you. Um, so for a little bit of a statewide update, um, it's no mystery to anyone that we're obviously seeing the highest levels of cases we've seen throughout the pandemic uh, at this point in time. And really, you know, since Thanksgiving, to be real, uh, a little bit after Halloween as well. Um, not to uh, not feel good about everything that happened between March and that time, because um, uh, we did as well as one could do as a state. I always like to say that if we were an island, like things would be even better. And we've tried to function as an island literally through the pandemic and pretty successfully. 
because when you look at what's going on, even regionally, we stand out so differently than the rest of the region, um, even with Quebec on top of us. Um, so I, I always wondered how long we could maintain that stance and we continue to maintain that stance in a relative way, even though absolute case numbers are up. Our deaths have really escalated to places that we never thought they would go. And as I announced today, even hospitalizations are now on the uh, rise here, though nowhere near threatening the um, hospital or healthcare system in terms of capacity. Uh, but we'll be watching that very closely, needless to say. We, uh, you know, for the longest time, were accustomed to single digits of cases every day or occasionally in the teens. Um, and here we are, you know, in the hundreds now when we had a couple of days in the 200s. The reality is it's wintertime. People are indoors. People have gathered more. People can't avoid crowds as much as they could uh, before. There may be some pandemic fatigue. Uh, preventing as much religious masking and distancing as uh, once was practiced. And the, the area and the country are on fire. They're all red on the maps. And Vermont looks orange or yellow, depending on which COVID tracker you're looking at. Uh, and it's the only one in the continental US. So at the very least, we'd like to maintain that, um, to say the least. The um, <clears throat> Success story of Vermont has a lot to do with compliance of people, because uh, fundamentally complying with public health guidance is what got us to where we are uh, and will hopefully keep us uh, safe for the future. In addition, we did have a very strong attention to protecting the most vulnerable, and that continues. Uh, we've been less successful or we wouldn't have had deaths in those settings, but the reality is we could have had way worse a picture. Um, when you look at the number of long-term care facilities that have actually been threatened or actually had outbreaks and deaths versus those who have not, uh, we've done uh, relatively well in that regard. If you wanna look at our three priorities, one is reducing illness and saving lives. The second is keeping an economy vibrant and workplaces open. And the third is really where we're here to talk about today, which is having as much in-person education as possible and keeping our education system open. Um, those are really where we're going for priorities in the state. The, um, and, and that should probably, let me segue from that to a little bit of discussion about the education arena before I get into the benchmarks. Um, I think the education, programming that we've gotten to to this point in time is a real success story, if you will. It's been success for students and their parents, for teachers and the staff, for ability to collaborate across state government and the close working relationship we've had with the Agency of Education. And actually, you know, even beyond that, um, for public health, health, health care sector partnership because it was no mistake that we had opened up education with a lot of people at the table. Obviously education professionals, but from the medical side, pediatricians, infectious disease experts, school nurses, public health and epidemiology experts, uh, you name it. Uh, we had a large table and uh, health got to inform the process very well and I hope everyone in this committee looks at the fall, we'll call it the fall semester for lack of a better word, looks at that as a success story in Vermont. Even if a lot of students were still in hybrid, even if not most students were not in, in person four to five days a week, it was a true success story, knowing we have a long way to go. Um, you may be familiar with this document, Strong and Healthy Start. This is essentially what catalyzed the reopening. It was a safety and health guidance for reopening schools. It's on its third version, if you will. Um, it's been an iterative, iterative public document, uh, first issued in June, revised twice. The last one was October. And literally everything we've learned about managing a pandemic is within its pages. And health has been in a very supportive role with regard to that. 
the kind of content it has builds on science that we understand about how the virus impacts adults, adolescents, and kids differentially, and uh, acknowledges those differences and capitalizes on them in trying to improve the experience for all. Obviously, the goal is to maximize in-person instruction with a secondary goal being especially in the K through six population who, are, who have been deemed to be those least proficient and comfortable with the online platform for learning. Not that we should say anybody in high school could learn online and that's a satisfactory high school experience. But this has been the North Star of our experience is trying to get the youngest kids back into a school setting where they're in person all the time. Um, lots of objectives that this manual helps with, including prevention, uh, minimizing transmission amongst whoever, um, containment strategies and how they work, even when there are cases in schools, and uh, communication strategies, which are invaluable for the school staff and especially the principals and superintendents when hard decisions have to be made because on Sunday night they learned they had two cases in a school. So really all aspects of student and staff health are discussed in there. Health screening, uh, the considerations you need to take into account if you have staff working there who have chronic conditions, uh, what to do about when we should have a stay home policy uh, when people are sick, who's included, who's excluded, uh, what to do about cases in school, what to do about testing, what to do about closing schools if God forbid it came to that. And all the usual hygiene things and buses and transportation and kitchen and food services, um, public use of schools, um, all of that's sort of covered within. Um, if there's one thing we've learned a lot about, it's that the success of education is intimately tied to the success of the state's overall management of the pandemic. Because we very rarely have closed a school. We very rarely, or at least for more than a few days, we very rarely have had a major uh, transmission of virus event occurring within school. Most of what we see is the impact of people living in their communities being subject to the amount of community spread that they're subject to living their daily lives. So when we see cases in schools, it might be a brother and a sister in two different grades who come from the same household. It might be a teacher. It might be a food worker who lives with somebody who was a bus driver who contracted it because of their profession. That kind of stuff and the safety rails that are built into the school experience with distancing and masking and all of that are protecting the rest of the population so that those number of cases never really result in a major trauma to the school and inability to carry out the educational mission. And I think that's really, really important. And in that sense, when I talk about the public's role in keeping schools open, it's just that. Um, we're only as good as our communities are, and our communities are only as good as everyone who lives in them behaving appropriately in a pandemic. Um, so that's really how things work. In addition to that, um, we did start, as you're aware, a surveillance strategy for testing in the adults in the schools. And we've had at various times anywhere from a third to a half of people testing in a given week. And we're again, and maybe Secretary French talked about this, finding very, very low positivity rates. So even acknowledging where you live and what community you're in, the teachers and the school staff are taking their jobs so seriously that they're actually having about a one-tenth positivity rate compared to the rest of the state. So while the rest of the state is in the mid twos, 2.5, 2.8% positivity, the schools are in a 0.25 positivity. Uh, very, very different. So when you talk about benchmarks and reopening schools, one thing is, um, again, numbers of cases, raw data like that, positivity rates, how the 
community is faring with regards to healthcare. Are the healthcare facilities being overrun with cases and reaching capacity, what have you? Um, do we have adequate testing capability all across the state, which the answer is yes, so that we know that we're not fooling ourselves when we get testing data, but we're actually seeing a broad swath of the Vermont population, both those who are symptomatic and asymptomatic, those who have been exposed, not exposed, those who are under surveillance testing, like teachers, like uh, healthcare workers in different settings, et cetera. Um, and this goes hand in hand with really assessing uh, how we're doing with regards to keeping kids in their school environment and keeping kids in an in-person school environment, um, because obviously all of those data pieces translate over into the school. With regard to the last thing you wanted me to mention, which was vaccination, um, you know, the problem with vaccination is we want to we want to make it a good time discussion and we want to make it the high point of everyone's day. But the reality is we have harsh realities we're facing. We can't vaccinate everybody at the same time. We don't get enough vaccine coming into the state uh, ever, and certainly not predictably. We, we can't tell one group of people, you're not a priority and another group you are. Uh, nobody feels like they should feel like they're not a priority. Uh, and they all have good reasons for wanting to be the priority. Um, so you never can deliver 100% good news to everybody all the time. This becomes especially acute when we're talking about teachers. You've heard that one of our three priorities as a state is schools. Unfortunately, I have to say it's, it's a priority, but saving lives comes first. And that's not my mantra. That's the governor's mantra, the governor's leadership team, leadership team mantra. And whenever we mention it to any Joe person on the street, they kind of get it. It's like, we're having people dying in Vermont. We're having people get really sick and need to be hospitalized. Maybe we should try to prevent that and make that our first priority especially because we have good data and the data we have shows that the older you are and the number of comorbid conditions you have predict if you're gonna be in that group at highest risk of a bad outcome. So why don't we focus on those people first? But that makes people who are not focusing on feel like second-class citizens. And there's no way around that. Now, uh, some states along with the CDC have chosen to try to make everybody feel good at the same time. They've said in priority group 1B, which is nomenclature we're not using, we're gonna to go to two, um, you're gonna have old people, you're gonna have people with chronic conditions, you're gonna have grocery store workers because they're public facing, you're gonna have teachers because they're public facing, frontline workers as they're called, you're gonna have other people they define as essential workers, knowing that essential workers, if you really broaden the definition as it's been done, is 80% of the workforce. Uh, so they're gonna have all of those people in the same group and say, you're our next priority, come get your vaccine. Well, it's gonna take them you know, six months to vaccinate all those people. And every day of the week, each one of those people who feel important is gonna feel less important because suddenly they can't get what they want. We are gonna basically just be honest and say, there's 40,000 people who are over 75 years old in Vermont. We're only looking at them first. We're gonna see how much vaccine comes in and get them vaccinated as quickly as possible. If it's only 8,000 doses a week, it's gonna take at least five weeks to get them vaccinated, but that's what happens. And then after they're done, but not quite after they're done, cause we wanna have a transition so we don't waste any vaccine, when they're almost done, we'll start the next band, 70 to 74, and accordingly go that way. Well, what does that mean if you're a teacher? It means you are literally 200,000 people away, unless you happen to be a teacher who's older or who has chronic conditions. I can't make that story feel good to a teacher. Uh, there's no way. Even if I told the teacher, you're next in line after the last person with chronic conditions gets their shot, you go first. Well, that's gonna be April, May, I don't know when. You know, it depends again on how much vaccine's available, how many new vaccines get developed, 
Uh, but that's what we're up against. So I'm just putting that on the table for you to understand. Um, it has nothing to do with, we have nothing but good words to say about teachers. We don't think ski patrollers are better than teachers or vice versa, but ski patrollers are actually working with sick people on the slope for a prolonged period of time. They're a first responder. They're doing healthcare directly. Uh, and that's why they were in group 1A. Uh, it's nothing to do with our prioritizing the ski industry over education by any means. Um, you might be interested to know that a funeral director is also in group 1A. Doesn't mean that they're more important than teachers, but God forbid you see what they do every day, they should have the vaccine. They're dealing with people who have died of COVID, who might have COVID and they don't know it yet because they took a specimen at the time of death and are waiting for it to come back from the lab. Um, and they're with the body for a long time. Uh, so I'm just throwing this all at you to give you a little better enlightenment. And I better stop so you have time to uh, get your questions in and tell me what I didn't talk about that you wanted me to talk about. Great, thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, Senator Fershley. Uh, thanks, Dr. Levine. I, I think the ski patrol thing did catch in a lot of teachers' craws. I got a lot of emails about that specifically. And what I assumed was one, it might not be all ski patrol, because I know like my brother-in-law is a volunteer ski patrol. Like he's he's not the guy dealing with sick people. He calls in the EMTs that are on ski patrol. So right. I tried to tell people it's not all ski patrol for one and two, I'm guessing there's not that really that many ski patrol. Like that's not changing the list that much. So no, and they're mostly EMTs, some are physicians. Um, so you're right. They all have reasons to be first in line anyways. Other questions, comments? So uh, if I could just go back for clarification then uh, Dr. Levine, um, actually Senator Lyons, you go first because you probably put your small hand up and I didn't see it. And by small hand, I don't mean your physical hand. I actually mean whatever those little yellow things that are that pop up. I put the ye little yellow hand up. You're absolutely right. All right. But, you know, I, 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 we're all getting these inquiries and emails and in particular, and we all have unmitigated sympathy and understanding about the concerns that people are bringing us. But the rationale that um, Department of Health is using sounds uh, really important in the, in the long run. And to really be able to say, we know where we're going and it's not, it's not hit or miss. Uh, but I do have I do have a, a question for you, and that is, we know that we're in this for a much longer haul than people might want, and that the vaccine appears to be the the end point, the the light at the end of the tunnel. But uh, can you just give us perspective? And this is for schools as much as it is for general public. A perspective on how long we are going to be vigilant. And I mean, social distancing and masks and, and so on. Yeah, so, you know, I anticipate the current two vaccines will have manufacturing revved up appropriately. So there'll be more than we have now of them. I do really anticipate at least one, if not two or three other vaccine platforms getting approval, perhaps as early as the beginning of February. Uh, we'll have to see how that plays out. Uh, and some of them, uh, because of Operation Warp Speed, already have some manufacturing capacity the government's already subsidized. So there'll be some doses of them coming. But even in the best of all worlds, we're talking late, probably mid to late summer before we really feel like we've gotten enough vaccine out there, assuming more people take it than don't take it. Um, to, to feel comfortable with our vaccination rate. Um, and so most people are trying to message late summer, early fall would be the earliest we would pull back from a stance of masking, distancing, all that stuff. I suspect it will go a little longer than that, to be honest, um, just because of the challenges that we're up against. And the fact that there's so much virus prevalence around now it's going to take some time to suppress that, and the warm weather will help. 
uh, because people won't be indoors as much, but the reality is still, it's gonna take time. So I would, I would say the fall, hopefully the early fall to be optimistic, but the fall. Dr. Levine. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, Senator Lyons, do you have a follow-up or? No, just to thank you. Okay. Uh, Dr. Levine, uh, two questions. A, a student or going back to school, I think the governor was talking about maybe an April date. Uh, it's, is it safe to assume that a, a student that might have um, an immune system issue, struggling with cancer or something, a diabetes, he, he or she would be vaccinated by the time they went back to school? That's my first question. And then second, is there, are we seeing that depending on the age of a child, is one age more susceptible to uh, getting the disease and having symptoms than others? I mean, I've just heard anecdotally that maybe younger children uh, might not be as susceptible and just sort of trying to get a sense of those two things. Yeah, so to take the second question first, um, it seems that the younger children are less susceptible. It probably has to deal with a receptor in their noses um, called the ACE receptor. And um, that's where the virus spike proteins that you see on that diagram bind to that receptor. That's less developed in our younger kids. So there's less opportunity for the virus to sort of invade, if you will. That's at least the theory that we've been operating under. Mm -hmm. And it seems pretty, pretty reasonably valid. So we say K through six because of the way schools are set up, but probably it's K through four or five where those kids are clustered and those age groups sort of 10 and under. And that's why child cares have been so successful too, because the infants are not usually the vectors of the virus to the adults. It would work most likely the other way around. And that happens both in child care and in school. If you ever find transmission, it's most likely from the adult to the child, not the other way around. Now, middle and high school are li a little bit different. Those kids actually can get infected more like adults, but they seem to have a higher rate of no symptoms than adults. So they may test positive, but not feel bad, where an adult might still feel bad, but they have a rate of infection that may approach what the adult has. With regard to the first question, I'm, I'm a little, uh, I don't wanna get out too far ahead of my skis or the governor because we're deciding that literally the next couple nights, uh, what age band will the chronic disease conditions go under? Mm -hmm. So we, we all agree that 65 and above, whether you have a chronic condition or not, you know, you're going first. But below 65, the question is, how broad will the age band be for chronic conditions? Will it be middle age and older? Will it be starting in your teens or 20s and older, uh, or will there be banding in that array? It's a little hard to say, so I, I can't give you with confidence the answer to that. All I can say is there will be a bunch of chronic diseases that mostly adults get, but in the, in the middle of them are things like cancer and having an immunosuppressive condition, uh, having sickle cell disease, those things a young person can have. So. Um, stay tuned. Okay, thank you. Senator Cheranzini. Thank you. Um, interesting, you would think the, this respiratory disease would um, be worse off for those with asthma, but everything I've read and seen suggests that asthmatics are not affected any worse than those without asthma. Are you still finding that to be true, Dr. Levine? And uh, our children, we know far too many children have asthma. Um, are you finding that kids with asthma are affected at all with, uh, with the virus? Yeah, so I, I still regard asthma as a risk factor for developing the disease a little more significantly, but it hasn't really panned out to have significantly worse outcomes. Um, there's two kinds of airways disease in human beings, to keep it simple. One is asthma, which we call a reversible airway disease, um, where there's inflammation and wheezing and cough and shortness of breath. 
Then there's emphysema, also called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, which is more fixed and irreversible. And that's usually from the damage from cigarette and smoking use. But those airways produce the same symptoms, but they don't reverse those symptoms as readily as someone with asthma. So we see the outcomes being much worse in that group because they're already impaired on a day-to-day -day basis chronically, whereas an asthmatic may be more episodically impaired depending on the circumstances. Uh, and if they're well-maintained, they may have lots and lots of days uh, forever and ever that they're doing very well. Um, whereas the people with COPD generally are having a downhill course over a long period of time. So COPD appears on the list of conditions, asthma does not for those reasons. Thank you. Uh, Senator Hooker. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Levine. Uh, I remember as a child being shepherded over to the high school to get my polio shot. And I'm wondering if thought has been given once the vaccine is available in um, higher quantities, if that's um, anticipated as a distribution, a type of distribution for school kids. Yeah, well, let's start with the school adults first, <laughs> yeah. because um, it would be an ideal place for school adults, especially with the growing number of school nurses we have around the state. We don't have a nurse for every facility, but I mean, one could work it out because they cover several facilities at times. So we would just set up clinics and that could make it easy for the school staff and teachers to um, get their vaccine when their time arrives. For the students, if we don't have any new vaccines approved, we only have Pfizer and Moderna and the youngest student that could get them would be age 16. So the problem you're posing wouldn't be a problem because most kids, uh, unless they're in the higher years of high school, uh, are younger than age 16. So getting it to the student wouldn't be an issue because they're not eligible to get it. Our hope is there'll be future vaccines that have more pediatric enrollment in the trials and that show the safety and efficacy profile we'd wanna see so that we would then wanna give it to the school students on a large scale basis. And I think the schools would be the place to do it. Why make them all schlep to a mass community vaccination center or to their pediatrician when you could give it all in a single setting as part of the context of a school day? So that's a great thought, but it's right now just a dream because we don't have a vaccine to give them. Any other questions? Uh, Dr. Levine, thank you so much. Do you, is there, do you have any other final comments for us before uh, we let you go? And we hope you'll just stay in contact, of course, as these decisions are being made, you know, just to keep us updated as much you, as you can, either through yourself or uh, Mr. Englander. And I know you're also working in conjunction with Senator Lyons' committee. Always very closely with Senator Lyons' committee. Yes, yes. Hmm. You'll have to vie with her to become my favorite. <laughs> Forget it. We know set, we'll never get there. We'll set up a little internal competition here. <laughs> um, all I can say is uh, I have no doubt that I'll be seeing your committee again. I mean, we've had a long history of success with the lead in school water. Yes. And uh, it's become apparent that there are always going to be issues that interface between health and schools. And our maternal child health section is such an important component of the health department. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there, are, there are no shortage of issues. So I'll look forward to interacting with you again in the future, but I don't have any other things to say about COVID today or the reopening of schools, except that um, even though we've come back from a pretty high peak of cases post Christmas, and we're seeing more cases in schools, it's still not impacting to any substantial degree the operation of schools. You know, you're not hearing about major schools that have closed down because of uh, what happened over Christmas. Uh, so keep our fingers crossed. I think um, the schools and everyone who works in them uh, and the parents who send kids to them really understand that this is a high stakes game and they need to really 
do their best so that our communities look as good as they can look and our schools can then benefit from that. So hope we, hope we can keep that uh, spirit of optimism up. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Take care. Thanks, you too. Bye-bye. All right, why don't we take uh, just about a uh, little more than a 10 minute break. We'll come back at 3.15, uh, less than 10 minute break, sorry. Uh, a little less than a 10 minute break. Come back at 3.15 and we'll pick up with this uh, Principals Association and the Superintendents Association. And as you know, we need to wrap up a little bit before four in order for uh, the chair's meeting to start. So uh, if you're going to leave, just make sure you turn, this YouTube is gonna continue to record. So just turn off your mic and uh, video. Thank you. All right, well, we're back from break and I see we have uh, Mr. Francis with us. How are you? I am well, how are you? Good, thanks. Uh, and uh, you brought someone with you, I believe. Yes, Dave Yount is the president of the Superintendents Association, and he's going to deliver most of the testimony. Okay. Well, however you would like to uh, kick us off, you know our question, I believe, which is, you know, what are you seeing? What are, uh, uh, what are some of the things that we can be doing for you as schools uh, are uh, grappling with COVID and thinking about reopening, et cetera? So as well as just introducing yourselves and telling new members uh, a little bit about the kind of work that you do and how we might expect to see you in this committee. Sure, I appreciate that. I'm gonna just open one document. If you'll bear with me, I'll be right there. So um, it's great to be with you all to see you again. These are certainly extraordinary times. I know you keep hearing that. Um, but uh, I wanted to give a very brief overview of the Vermont Superintendents Association and then look to Dave Yount, who's going to talk about what it's like on the ground for school districts right now. Um, the Superintendents Association um, is a nonprofit organization comprising members, uh, including superintendents, assistant superintendents, and we have a few retired superintendents who stay interested in public education, um, and they uh, are with us as professional affiliate members. We've got about 70 members overall. We operate with three staff. I'm the executive director. Uh, Two years ago now, two and a half years ago, the association added a position of associate executive director. Um, that's Chelsea Myers, who will be a regular presence in your committee as well. And we have an office manager who's Christy Tate. The organization was founded in the 1940s. We had our first full-time executive director in 1987. That was my predecessor, Richard Tate who now is the vice president, I think, of administrative affairs at UVM. Some of you know Richard. Um, I joined the association as executive director in the late 1990s. So I have a long history in the education policy arena, working with the General Assembly um, and others in public education affairs. Uh, basically, the association does three things. We create professional learning and networking opportunities for superintendents and other educational leaders. We're active in the public policy and management arena and focus on promoting laws, regulations, policies, and initiatives in support of equity, of high quality learning opportunities, efficient use of resources, and we support individual members in the successful execution of their leadership roles. So we're very active in the policy arena. I talk with a number of superintendents on a daily basis in terms of supporting their work. And we also are supporting increasingly uh, superintendents in coming together to support one another in professional development opportunities. Um, right now, we're serving 55 superintendents um, in a, a broad array of professional development activities. And as you might imagine, since the onset of COVID back in March, that has dominated not only a lot of time on the part of superintendents and school districts, educators in general, but also the Superintendents Association as well as other associations. Um, my background is I've spent a large part of my career in public education with the association. 
I have experience as a town manager. I worked for a time in Madeline Cunin's administration. Um, I worked in the nonprofit housing development arena. So my background's entirely in public management and I've always worked um, hard to do my best to support the best outcomes for the taxpayer dollar. Um, and in the case of public education, the kids and communities in the state. Um, I mentioned that David is uh, the president. He and I have worked more closely in the role of president and executive director than at any other time in my career, largely because of the work associated with COVID. So as a non-superintendent myself, I didn't have the context or experience for the day-to-day -day operations. And superintendents are working both with the association and with one another across community like never before. So with that, I would like to turn to David Younts, who's the superintendent um, for the Mill River Unified Union School District. Uh, he's been active doing his job at Mill River as well as supporting colleagues, um, again, since the outset of the pandemic. And he's got a, a number of insights that he can share with you in response to your question about uh, coronavirus navigation and what it's been like for school systems. So David, I'd like to turn to you. You bet. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, Senator Campion and the committee, thank you for uh, allowing me to join you today. As Jeff said, I'm the superintendent at Mill River, which is in Rutland County, just south of Rutland. Uh, served the four towns of Clarendon, Shrewsbury, Tinmouth, and Wallingford. I'm a resident of Arlington, Vermont, in Bennington County, between uh, Bennington and Manchester. And I am in year seven in my current role. And this is year seven in Vermont for me. I'm a, a flatlander by nature. I can admit that openly to you. Uh, came here from the Chicago suburbs where I grew up. My wife has family connections in Vermont and we made the decision that Vermont was where we wanted to be about eight years ago. And, and we made that happen and, and certainly don't regret making that move. Um, I appreciate Jeff giving me the opportunity to, to share with you today. And of course, I would be glad to answer any, any questions you might have um, after my comments are concluded. So first, superintendents on the whole are generally complimentary and appreciative of the overall response of the administration statewide. We understand that there are things that we will never understand about the details and the challenges inherent in state administrative decision-making. We appreciate the work of Governor Scott and Governor Scott's team in leading Vermont through the pandemic. Some of our early challenges as we reflect back on, you know, January, February, March, included the following, lack of knowledge about the virus, uh, organizational and communications challenges, and responding to concerns of the school community and the community at large, especially as things started to escalate in early March, the weeks of March 2nd and March 9th that we can all look back on and recall what that felt like. There was a definite escalating intensity over the course of that time. VSA as an organization exerted its influence in March to inform the ultimate decision to close schools, largely because of those escalating concerns and the operational pressures that we were experiencing in our school communities and the community at large. During the first month of school closures, districts reacted very quickly and efficiently to feed students, prop up what we now know to be a less than ideal remote learning system, shift to remote work environments overnight and manage the social, emotional, technology, employment, physical health, and nutritional needs of our students and staff in ways that schools had never before seen at a scale that schools had never before faced. In the early months of the pandemic, school districts were required to develop continuity of learning plans, which would account for how schools would manage and navigate the needs, both known and unknown, that lie ahead. That process began with fits and starts as draft models required significant revision. VSA played a key role in that process and required reporting and planning efforts needed to align with the work that was actually being done on the ground in school districts. Vermont schools have found federal dollars supporting COVID relief efforts to be invaluable. The mechanics and timing of approval, of course, have been challenging at times, but we are aware that the Agency of Education has worked diligently to identify and distribute funds to schools to meet directly connected COVID needs in areas like staffing, materials and technology, PPE, and many other qualified expenses. Without that support, the fiscal crisis that we face now would be exponentially exacerbated. We're grateful for the AOE's work in that regard. 
One of the significant challenges facing school districts in the pandemic has to do with the myriad human resources challenges that emerge as a result of the pandemic. Decisions around disability determinations, virus vulnerability status, remote work options, equity and equality, and quarantine dynamics generate daily decision points that have to be navigated with clarity and consistency in order to not place districts in any jeopardy. Many or most Vermont school districts and SUs do not have separate human resource de departments to navigate these types of decisions. What this means is that the same individuals who are tasked with communicating to staff that they care about all employees and want to support people through the difficult times of the pandemic are also faced with informing those same individuals that their requests or needs may not be able to be met. This is a dynamic that existed at a very small scale prior to the pandemic. It is unfortunately rampant now. VSA in collaboration with VSBA pursued clear, jointly generated legal guidance from multiple educational attorneys throughout the state in order to ensure that superintendents had good information at hand in order to make the best legal consistent decisions possible. By the way, on that note, VPA also joined us in that process. This is a role that we were compelled to play. In an ideal world, that guidance would have come to us from state resources. Superintendents and boards have been granted latitude to make operational decisions in our local districts, which is appropriate and greatly appreciated. Challenges do emerge though in all districts when aspirations expressed by the state and state officials and the reality of conditions and logistics locally are in conflict. As a result, local decision-making often translates to local backlash that falls at the feet of the local decision-makers. While this is all a part of the work, it contributes greatly to the collective exhaustion that school leaders and other decision makers feel. The pandemic in very simple terms has been a leadership exercise that involves responding to aspirational statements, navigating local dynamics and statewide rules around decision making and preparing for the fallout. This is made even more challenging as you are aware by the proliferation of social media. It has been accurately portrayed that virus cases are not spreading in schools in the same way that they are in the broader community. This is largely due, in my opinion, to the fidelity with which school district employees have adhered to the health and safety guidelines required, not only at school, but also in their personal lives. School district employees, in my opinion, deserve great credit for that fidelity. However, outbreaks and cases do occur in schools and children and adults do get sick. Responding to those cases and outbreaks, case by case, school by school, and classroom by classroom is an all-encompassing experience for our local schools and districts. Some districts have seen more cases than others. Most all districts have been affected. Schools are not specifically engaged in contact tracing, which I would interpret to mean the process of, of identifying and contacting those who are determined to be close contacts with a positive case in the broader community. But it is important that the committee understand that schools are very involved in identifying, tracking, and communicating with all parties linked to a case that is connected to a school. While this approach has proven to be a faster approach than the Department of Health is able to deliver on, which does make sense from a procedural standpoint, it is also worth noting that involved staff members who engage in that work become completely immersed in that work until all of that work is done. This also requires significant other areas of operational focus to be set aside for the immediate quarantine related concerns to be addressed. We have experienced in Vermont schools significant challenges with messaging and decisions made at the level of state government and how those messages play out at the local level. Some examples, the public push in the fall for all students to access in-person school when the required health guidelines prevented that from occurring in many places due to the social distancing requirements that limited the number of individuals who could be in a school. The public proclamations that athletics should occur, particularly in the winter season, when school leaders and prominent physicians statewide indicated extreme concerns about such an action. The timing of decisions around holiday breaks related to multi-household gatherings and school districts role in executing and communicating about those decisions. And finally, the admittedly aspirational desire to have all students return to school in person following April break, 
without necessary context provided for families and teachers, indicating that virus conditions and social distancing requirements are the ultimate variables in that type of decision. Employee virus testing in schools is going reasonably well. The infrastructure established by state government is in place to sustain that effort over the long term. School district employees appreciate the simplicity of that process and the turnaround time in terms of results. Vaccinations are becoming more and more of an area of focus for school district employees. Who gets vaccinated, when, and the variability that does exist regionally raise a great number of questions about who is responsible for communication on those topics and how. In many ways, the vaccine question links back to the question of keeping schools open to in-person learning. The cognitive dissonance on this topic experienced by school district employees is having a significant effect on our workforce. They are struggling with understanding why, if schools are critical to remain open to best serve our students and our society, school employees are not considered worthy of early vaccine administration. They realize that others are essential as well, but have not seen others mandated to return to in-person work in the interest of maintaining the economy. If there is a possibility that schools can indeed return to full in-person instruction after April break, ensuring that all school district employees have had access to a vaccine as soon as possible seems to be an important milestone in that process. Finally, there are of course, numerous COVID related educational needs. I'll share a few examples. As it relates to learning loss and recovery, what we are seeing is that the educational, nutrition, and social emotional needs that we face now are what they always have been. The pandemic in many ways has illuminated and magnified the cracks and discrepancies that exist and, and truly, truly highlighted what needs to be worked on in Vermont. We know that remote learning, especially the quickly developed version that was developed across the world in the springtime, pales when compared to in-person learning opportunities. But we also know that high quality remote learning systems, which many districts have worked hard to develop, are a reasonable substitute when there is no other choice. The lessons we've learned from the pandemic about instructional delivery will have positive impacts, I believe, on our systems as we continue to seek to meet our objectives and the goals of Act 77 in particular. The social and emotional needs of our students and employees are being monitored and attended to as best as we are able. We do know that there will be recovery necessary when the pandemic concludes. District are, districts are largely focused on navigating this school year as best as we are able and planning for a fall that hopefully feels more normal and has supports in place that are both required and newly developed in order to serve our students and staff as well as possible. Ultimately, it is our hope that the General Assembly does more than just understand the impressive work that school districts and school employees have accomplished with the support of boards, staff, and communities. It is our hope that the General Assembly recognizes that the best expression for school districts, at, I'm sorry, the best expression of support for school districts at this time does not take the form of new ideas and new initiatives. It takes the form of time and space time and space to lead through the remainder of the pandemic, time and space to complete the implementation of significant important legislation already in place, time and space to take care of kids, staff, and communities, and finally, time and space to finish a good work started. Vermont is full of good people who seek to do the right things for the right reasons, and our schools are a microcosm of that cultural reality. I wish to thank you for providing us with the opportunity to work to deliver on our promises, to meet and exceed your expectations and contribute ably to Vermont, to its recovery and to its future success. Thank you for having me today. Thank you. And, and I'm hoping you'll submit your written testimony. There's a lot there uh, and it'll give us an opportunity since we, uh, I do, don't wanna cut Mr. Nichols short, but we do have time for a couple of uh, brief questions if people have them. Uh, I think my only question really is, how are you communicating or how are they communicating the Department of Health with the Superintendents Association? I mean, we just finished a long conversation with Dr. Levine where he took us through why certain decisions were being made uh, and how those decisions are being made. I think it would be helpful for 
you and your association to have a similar conversation. I'm just wondering what that looks like. Yeah, you bet, Senator Campion. I'll, I'll, I'll speak first and then defer to Jeff. Um, my interaction with the Department of Health or our districts really occurs largely through our school nurses. When there are situations, when there are cases, that's where the, the line of communication occurs and that's how things are processed when there are positive cases and tracing that needs to be done. Uh, Jeff, are you able to speak to our interactions with uh, the Department of Health as an association? Yeah, I mean, it happens at a number of different levels. So Dan French gave a good characterization of how the agency of education works with the field and he's our lead contact the um we have representatives on the strong and healthy start initiative and jay nichols who's going to speak next is actually on that committee i'm not that committee has the health department represented in a number of different positions so they bring science um and the public health approach to the, to the conversations. We don't have, we have almost no interaction with um, Commissioner Levine. And what Dave alluded to in his testimony was, you know, oftentimes we'll think that things are heading in one direction and then the governor will have a press conference and we find out that it's moving in a different direction. So just like you would expect in any large organization, there's decisions, there's models, and so on and so forth. So when Dave Younce talks about challenges associated with communications, you know, not a week goes by that we don't hear about some operational challenge that a school district or districts have to contend with because there are expectations that have been set that don't um, materialize that way. And your committee in its conversation with both Secretary French and Commissioner Levine, touched on that with the matter of vaccinations, for example. And what we have done is we've become pretty adept at rolling with the punches, as it were. Um, but when Dave Younce talks about the implications of social media and how word spreads in a school community, you know, and it might be about a decision to go remote or to, um, to to sort of contend with the dynamics of the COVID. That is a real time experience for superintendents on a daily basis. Another very quick example, I'm getting texts right this minute um, about another meeting that we're hosting currently. You're going to see this issue in the form of H48 at the end of this week, trying to navigate town meeting and voting in the, in the, in the COVID era, right? So um, districts like Dave Younce's, which is a unified district for communities, they've got real issues with sort of synchronizing what the municipalities want to do vis-a-vis -vis what the schools are doing just to get smooth voting procedures. Um, and then the last example I'll leave you with, and if you want to delve into this, we can come back and have a more sort of conversational approach. But the, the point that um, Dave Yaps made about employment issues, as the federal programs changed and people are eligible for various forms of employment benefit, as you might imagine, you know, people are extremely interested about that because it's their livelihood. So it's, it's a too long a winded way of saying it is a constant navigation. Everybody's very well intended, but the channels within the river as we move forward to navigate are, you know, they get roily. It's a, it's very, very challenging. And one of the, one of my jobs um, has become just checking in with people on a daily basis, making sure they're okay. Cause superintendents are, are, you know, they, they work hard anyway, but they're working harder, more hours, many days more than even ever before. Same thing for principals and everybody, teachers. It's just, it's taking its toll, but there's a tremendous amount of resiliency. And I think we should just all be, you know, despite, despite all of it, be very, very proud for where we are as a state. No, I think we are, and we appreciate the two of you coming in and we will likely have you back sooner rather than later. I do want to turn it now to Mr. Nichols. Uh, I, I, so we don't cut him short. Uh, uh, Mr. Nichols, good to see you again. Uh, as you know, we, we do need to stop a little bit before four o'clock and I apologize for running a little bit late with our uh, prior witness. If you feel as though we are 
cutting you short in any way, uh, you're of course welcome to come back tomorrow, but we are eager to hear what the Principals Association, our uh, principals statewide are seeing and uh, turn it over to you. Okay, I think Jeannie's okay. gonna share uh, this screen, Jeannie, is the one that we won't use, that we don't need to use and, and so that we can save time. If you can go to the one that just has the table in it. Just to, uh, I'm Jay Nichols for the record, Executive Director of the Vermont Principals Association. Uh, the VPA was founded in, in 1915. We were known as the Vermont Headmasters and they were founded basically to regulate sp high school sports in the state of Vermont. 1989, they became the Vermont Principals Association and over the last over several the last decades, several decades. Uh, the VPA has become more involved with uh, legal support, um, education, professional learning, uh, supporting in the legislature. And Jeannie, this is the one we that we don't want. And the other one, why she's doing that, uh, I will let you know that VPA is made up of uh, 600 members, principals, assistant principals, and athletic directors. And we have an executive council that represents the entire state of 15 individuals, a uh, career center director, an assistant principal, um, a retired principal, and then the other ones are all uh, active participating principals and our current principals. Jeannie, do you see the other, can you see the other document that I submitted? Let's see here. I have it on my screen. If I can take over as host, that would work too, but. Jeannie, are you with us? I am with you. I, and I can't find the document. So Jay, can you share it? Yep, I've got it right here. Am I a host now? I will make you one. Okay. All right. You should see a document now on my screen that says uh, Senate Education Testimony, VPA, logo on the top. Did everybody see that? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, I submitted three pieces of, of documentation to you, and I realize we don't have time to go over them all. The first one is just an overview of the VPA, how it works, what benefits our members get, those types of things. And I'm willing to come back anytime to answer any questions on that. The third one that I also won't share with you is an educator bill that we'd like you to consider as a committee bill that is about educator retirement. It goes right to Senator Lyons uh, questions around substitute teachers um, and how we can use for subs and for hiring personnel that we're having trouble hiring. We're proposing a retirement bill that would allow people to come out of retirement to fill hard to fill positions. And as Superintendent Yeltsin can tell you and, ex and Executive Director Francis, that's a huge issue across the state, especially in our rural schools. We have uh, retired science teachers and math teachers that we could easily use, uh, as well as specialists in special ed that are in retirement. But because of our retirement system, they can only make a certain amount, so they're not willing to come back out of retirement. So please take a look at that, and we can talk about that further at some other time. In terms of uh, the table that I put together, I just wanted to share a couple of quick thoughts and give you time for questions. That was really my main purpose. Uh, the major issues are the uh, buckets on the left-hand side, and these are issues I've heard from principals uh, since March. Broadband connectivity, huge problem. I've written a couple grants uh, for uh, with with a couple of legislators last year to try to get more money into the state and help with that. That's a huge equity issue for the state of Vermont. It's a huge equity issue for our for our kids. It makes remote learning, you know, very less than desirable in, in many cases. Many kids simply cannot access the opportunity. Other people have talked about remote learning. Uh, I think David Yount said it best. You know, it's better. It's you know, it's better than we thought it could be in a lot of cases, but it's certainly no substitute for in-person instruction. We need to get kids back to in-person instruction. To do that, we need to make sure we can mitigate the the virus uh, so that it's safe to do so. Substitute teachers, I just touched on. Hiring teachers, staff, and administrators across the state is a huge problem as we're as we're looking forward. I've had a number of principals this year telling me they're going to retire early, at least in part due to the situation with dealing with the pandemic. And I know that's the case with teachers too. Some national surveys are showing that many principals and teachers and superintendents are talking about retiring two, three, four years earlier than they were initially planning 
because of the stress brought on by this year. Whether people follow through that or not, we, you know, we don't know at this time, but prior to this, we had an education pipeline problem. We need more educators in the field. And one area we can tap into is our retired educators that we don't use nearly uh, well enough. And you'll see in the educated retirement bill uh, document that I shared with you, some states are already doing this. And we have plenty of people that come to Vermont from other states that take principalships and draw their full retirement after being a principal for 25 or 30 years somewhere else. And we need to look at doing that in our own state. Um, school budgets, another piece I put in there, I think uh, I'm, I'm nervous about this. A number of principals have told me they're already being directed to cut budgets. Uh, and we think the social, emotional, and academic needs of our students are certainly the highest that they've been in my 30 something years in, in this industry. Um, we also uh, ask you to make sure that the administration helps support the administration to use federal funds and other sources to the degree possible to help keep the taxpayer rate burdened down. Uh, flexibility is gonna be really important with the funds that we just received and with the next package that we're hoping is gonna come with President-elect Biden's administration. Early childhood, I want to quickly touch on that. The VPA has a position statement that all four-year-olds should be provided early kindergarten access. We see this as being uh, an, another equity issue. Our neediest children do not get access right now. What we have in Act 166 in many cases is a subsidy for people that already have money and already have daycares for their children. If we're serious about supporting our most vulnerable children, then we need to do what Oklahoma did and some other states have done and the country of France has done and have full day school uh, opportunities for our four-year-olds in school or schools. If they can't, don't have the room, they'd have to provide it in a partnership with another provider. And I'll, I'll be glad to speak to you anytime on that as I've been preaching it for quite a few years now. Uh, education funding, we know the waiting study is gonna be a big issue. Um, I would suggest here, if at all possible, that if the waiting study starts in one of the education committees, the conversations around that, I think it would be better if it was in your committee, uh, Senator Campion, simply because the Senate has the ability to have a broader perspective uh, than the House. And that's not a knock on anybody. It's just you have, you represent more constituents. You're more likely to have people from different towns that could be seen as quote winners and losers. Whereas uh, in House, somebody might represent only one or two towns. So it's just something to think about. That's gonna be critical work. And the 20,000 foot view is gonna be better than the 20 foot view. Act 46, uh, we don't support any legislation that would allow people to, to pull out of mergers. Uh, we think that a lot of work was done on that and we need to try to stay the course with that to provide more opportunities for students. And then finally, and most importantly, and I know I'm going really fast. I, want, I know you have another meeting. Education recovery. No, oh, you're doing great. Take oh, your time. We don't want to rush you. You can always come back. This is excellent testimony and, and I love the, the layout. It's, it's, it's very well done. Thank you. Uh, education recovery is the big one. Secretary French um, has talked about that in our, our meetings on Friday afternoons. Um, I've been bringing this up for a while and the Agency of Education has said right, rightly that they were not ready to turn their eyes towards it yet and now that now they are. Um, I'm not just thinking academics. I think there's a lot we can do in academics. I think the COVID relief funds, again, federal the federal funds, we need lots of flexibility. We need to be looking at things like mass tutoring, work study internships, credit recovery programs, even, even paying students to do internships, you know, that allow them to do the proficiencies necessary to get their graduation requirements. We're, we need to think out of the box on this. This, this recovery situation is going to be three to five years if things go well. It's not going to be an overnight fix, and we all know that. And then lastly, the last sentence there, the social emotional needs are immense. We have a lot of kids who are tuning out, especially in places that are more remote. We have a lot of kids that are not even participating in remote learning um, or are only coming to school on the two days that they might be in person if they're a hybrid. That's a huge issue that principals and superintendents are dealing with. Secretary French is right. I don't really see it as much as a truancy issue as an engagement issue. And we need to find a way to get these kids back into the fold. And if we don't, our whole economy and our whole social fabric is gonna suffer for the inability to do that. And I'll just conclude my, my written remarks right there. And I've shared the materials with you and I'm glad to come back anytime to speak to your committee and answer any questions. Uh, that was great. Uh, okay, questions. Let's see uh, if I've got, make sure I can see everybody. 
somebody has their hand up. I'm not seeing it. I, oh, Cheryl, uh, I Senator Parker, please. Thank, thank you, Senator. Um, thank you, Mr. Nichols. I'm, I had asked the question of Secretary French uh, about what was being done for the staff with regard to um, helping to relieve the stress. And I didn't know if the Principals Association and the Superintendents Association um, had any insight as to um, what is being done to address um, the inordinate stress that's being placed on staff. That's a, that's a great question. What we've done, I can't speak for other organizations. What we've done is through a partnership with the Center for Creative Leadership and a uh, grant fund that we have that was an endowment left to the DPA uh, through um, the Center for Creative Leadership and what's called the Waddington Initiative. Uh, Dr. Waddington was a doctor from Rutland, Vermont that left $14 mm -hmm. million dollars that essentially is, goes to the BPA and the Center for Creative Leadership. And what we've done with uh, a number, some of that money, we're living off the principle, is we've set up um, a number of workshops that are free this year, 12 of them so far. Um, three of them are uh, around building um, resistance and helping people deal with stress. We've also had workshops with um, uh, Dave Melnick, who's spoken to, to uh, principals and teachers. He uh, works for NFI. He's a uh, probably the top known state person for working with uh, schools around issues of mental health and taking care of yourself. And we also have uh, several other trainings that are coming up in partnership with the Center for Creative Leadership that are on things like stress reduction, how to take care of yourself so you can take care of the kids. And those are limited spots. There's, we only have opening for 30 in each group because of the constraints of the grant. But by the time it's done, we're gonna have served about 300 Vermont educators for, for free and no cost to them at all. So we're trying to do our part there. The second thing that, that we've done, this is through partnership with the Vermont Community Fund and VSA has helped us by, um, by serving on a grant committee with us. We've had a lot of money given to our organization as grant money to provide mini grants to schools. And we've set up outdoor classrooms and schools have done this work and come uh, pl applied to us and got the grant money. And we've given out about a quarter of a million dollars so far uh, since, since the start of the school year. Um, and tons of schools have received money and they, they submit grants. And many of those things are around things like mental health for teachers with their students. They, they all have to have a student focus on them, but things like yoga in the classroom, as crazy as that might sound, uh, there's a lot of research supporting things like that that help deactivate stress. So we've been trying to do a lot of that, but we've got a lot more we could do, Senator Hooker. Excellent, thank you. And, and well, Superintendent Younts, I left Mill River the year that you came. So I'm sorry oh, I no. had to work with you. I hope I didn't drive you off, Senator Hooker. I hope that was not the case. Uh, you know, the question you just asked, uh, I'll give a local response first and then try to speak a little bit more broadly. We just finished negotiations with our support staff. We ratified an agreement. And actually, for the first time, we have a, a wellness benefit that is included in our support staff agreement where kind of a tangible exchange of, of accumulated leave time and people can use that to um, receive reimbursement for things that promote physical activity, outdoor activity, you know, we just have a list of, of things that we are looking at that are acceptable and looking to build upon that. We're still negotiating with teachers and working through that process as you folks know how that plays out. Um, on a more informal level, you know, I found with, with superintendent colleagues, we used to meet and the Rutland delegation and, and Bennington County delegation, you know, we would have formal meetings with with our legislative leaders, but also as, as superintendents, we would tend to meet monthly in our regional groups. And it won't surprise you that those meetings have greatly increased in quantity and frequency. Um, and I've found that from a, the standpoint of a superintendent's life, the collegial support and camaraderie and problem solving that occurs in that context helps people from a well being standpoint. I've also seen that translate with school staff in general, you know, creating opportunities for people to get together and just share what they're experiencing to be candid about their anxieties and their difficulties to, to be transparent and get ideas from each other is really positive and really productive. Um, on the broader VSA level, we are, we've created some of the same opportunities and formalized those. We have Every couple of weeks, we have drop-in meetings, usually focused around two key topics, one COVID-19 navigation, and the other 
racial equity and equity leadership in the state of Vermont. And again, sharing ideas, talking about challenges and successes, and just just using group um, group understanding, group ideas, and candidly, group emotion to help people make good decisions. So nothing nothing fancy, but definitely tangible and impactful. Jeff, uh, is there anything that I missed on the VSA side that would be worth sharing? The only thing I would add is it's, uh, you know, and I think this is for every um, cohort or segment of the education delivery system, the connection that's been formed among superintendents who are who I work with is just remarkable. And I think it's probably true for principals and teachers as well. So you know, the, the, the rallying of the community, despite the challenges, is just extraordinarily impressive. That stated, you know, I do have conversations with Dave as president from time to time and suggest, you know, checking in on colleagues because these positions are pretty lonely and stressful and we need to be watching out for one another. And I think everybody knows that, but there's nothing more significant than following up with action. And we try to inspire that and make sure people reach out. Um, so it's, you know, that that's the life we're living right now. Right. All right, any other final questions? Thank everybody for coming in. And uh, as for uh, committee, if we could just stick around for one more minute. Again, thank you, Mr. Nichols, Mr. Thank you. Yons, Mr. Francis. Good to see you all. Uh, just two quick uh, housekeeping items. One, going back to some of the uh, uh, priorities that we talked about earlier today, one that I didn't mention is hopefully partnering with the Biden administration uh, as it comes, to, as it is as, with regard to whatever their priorities might be. Some ma might match with the state. Others might not, but certainly making the case that Vermont is small, nimble. If they're looking to try certain things, it would be great if, if they would look at us as a laboratory, whether it has something to do with free college, tuition uh, reimbursements, early childhood, uh, broadband. Those are the kinds of things that I think we're well positioned, no matter what political stripe you might be from. We, we, I believe Senator Leahy is going to be the chair of appropriations. We, uh, you know, we, we want to align ourselves as much as possible. And sometimes it might work, sometimes it might not. Sometimes some of their priorities might not match with ours, but uh, it's something that I'm certainly interested in. And then secondly, uh, Jeannie, if you wouldn't mind uh, sharing your uh, cell phone with folks, if you would email that around, that would be great if you're comfortable doing so. That way people can uh, text you if, uh, they're having difficulty getting online or if they have a specific question, uh, if you're not comfortable with that, that's absolutely fine as well. Um, but if so, it would be terrific. I think sometimes we miss saying things in the chat. Final thoughts, comments, uh, concerns at this point? Uh, yes, Senator Hooker, please. Just that I, I'm glad you brought up that you had forgotten something this morning, as did I, and I'm sure that we'll have other opportunities, won't we, to bring yeah. Bring up topics. Um, one of the ones, the tuition reimbursement, I remember being having my loan forgiven if I stayed in and taught in the state. And mm -hmm. I can see that as a possibility for education as well as for health um, people in the healthcare uh, industry. So I think I hope that we can talk about stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it's been it's really, in, really informative today. I'm really. Okay. Oh, Good. Yeah. Uh, I think the other piece for me is, uh, you know, I'm ha having a bill drafted and please anybody else interested, let me know. But we keep talking about this being a unique year. And I, I wonder if we should be exploring allowing students to have a free year at CCV, uh, an extra 13th year, if you will, an opportunity to continue their learning that things might not, things may have been missed. You know, this is, this is again, a unique year, unique circumstances. And I think, you know, looking at it that way and using some of these funds to say, you're graduating this year, you know, a free year at CCV to take additional courses or to start your college education is something I'm, I'm certainly interested in. And just ping me if you, you'd like to be a part of it and I'll send it around when we're finished drafting. 
Uh, anything else from the committee before uh, I let you go? And a few of us have to go to another meeting. Otherwise, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank Take you. Care. Thanks.